I'm going to get started because um, um, I want to get through a lot, and I thought about cutting this, and I apologize if it's too much material, but I thought most of it were pictures, so I thought it would be okay, and you'd enjoy it. Um, so first I want to, it's, it's almost November, right? And so I just want to take a moment to thank you all for taking good care of my patients. Sometimes we forget to do that, and it's so important to me when you're on call that you do what's important so that the patient does the best, and I know you do, and so I want to thank you. So having said that, I'm going to try to go through now ROP, X-linked retinoschisis, just some of the things in pediatric retina. Many of the conditions are really rare, and so um, we don't see them very often. These are the more common ones. Crohn's <laughs> disease, familial, agitated vitreal retinopathy, and just a little bit on non-accidental trauma. So I know you, I, I assume you get a lot on ROP through pediatric ophthalmology too, so I'll kind of go through this uh, a little bit quickly, but what I want to do is, ROP is constantly evolving as we're able to save ever smaller and younger uh, premature infants. So I wanted to sort of bring it into light into the modern day in the United States. So preterm birth in the U.S. accounts for about 11 to 12 percent of all live births, so it's pretty common. It's amazing that it's that common. And ROP uh, is a leading cause of childhood blindness. It's about 14% in the U.S., but it can be up to 20% and even higher in some of the developing nations. So the developing nations that may lack some of the resources necessary to for perinatal and prenatal care, so the maternal nutrition is important, also oxygen regulation. And it's not even whether or not they have ventilators. It has to be like, do they have respiratory therapists who can make sure that the ventilator settings are right. So all these kinds of things play into it. And we've really gone from preventing stage five ROP and treating severe ROP to really looking at ways to prevent severe ROP and to optimize visual function. And on the right, it's stage five ROP. That's what we used to say we want to prevent that. So it looks like a cataract, but it's actually a scar behind the lens. The lens is clear and there's a total retinal detachment. So we want to prevent that from happening. But what's, what's interesting about treating severe ROP and thinking about that is if, if we look at the early treatment ROP study, which looked at earlier uh, treatment with laser uh, for severe ROP, that what they considered successful, those infants who had uh, treatment and um, didn't go on to uh, retinal attachment, 25% of treated infants had 2060 or worse vision at six years, so that they're visually impaired. Now, their, their vision may continue to improve, but there, there's also high myopia strabismus, so clearly there's a lot of room to improve what we do in ROP treatment. And the, the infants who had severe ROP but were not treated were randomized to not treatment. So in the early treatment ROP study, the threshold was a 15, about 1.5% risk of a bad outcome. So when you think about it, 85% of kids will probably do all right without treatment. Um, those kids who naturally regressed had better vision. So, you know, maybe it's the laser treatment that's a problem. So we, we have to understand how to uh, prevent severe ROP and improve visual outcomes. Um, the other thing that we need to be aware of is that ROP and the degree of prematurity are highly aligned and there are associations with extreme prematurity and low cognitive function and low neural development in infants. And there's more and more work and research being done in this understanding of the neurovascular effects that occur in ROP. I mean, when you think about it, the retina has so many cell types, and we talk about angiogenesis, but we have the effects of the glial Mueller cells on endothelial cells and the neural cells on the endothelial cells and the different ligand receptor interactions. So these are other areas that we're gonna hear more and more about. Ways to improve neural development, ways to thereby potentially prevent severe ROP. And these are areas where all of us are doing research currently. So historically, because we all hear about oxygen in ROP, and I just wanna lend, give you some context about this. So, ROP was first described in premature infants, but in 36-week gestational age. You know, now 23-week, 24-week gestational age infants are living. 
And they had no idea what it's from. I mean, they just started incubators. They didn't have ways to really monitor the temperature. They, you know, the, um, and the infants have a different way of, of uh, oh, I forget what they call them, but cooling themselves and heating themselves. They haven't matured into adults the way we do it. So there were a lot of things that the new incubators didn't do. They didn't regulate oxygen very well. And so there was, there was a flurry of, uh, there were a flurry of studies done to recreate uh, the incubator setting in um, animal models. And a lot of these animal models were not premature, but they developed retinal vasculature after birth or, or they were affected by high oxygen at birth. So like for example, kittens exposed to 80% uh, oxygen had this vasoobliteration and vasoconstriction followed by vasoproliferation. And so people often talk about those two phases, vasoobliteration and vasoproliferation. They're really, the phases are based on animal models. They're not really based on human ROP because the ability to see the retinas then, it, it wasn't universally where we screened infants. Uh, there was no indirect ophthalmoscopy. You know, it, was, it was hard to see the peripheral retina if you had a small pupil it would be difficult. So um, it was then Arnold Patz who really did the first clinical trial where he exposed infant, or he, he looked at two groups of infants, normal versus high oxygen at birth, and found that high oxygen caused retroelectral fibroplasia or ROP. Then efforts were made to reduce uh, oxygen levels, virtually obliterated ROP, but there was increased uh, <coughs> problems with neural development. So it, too low oxygen wasn't good either. And then a number, fast forward, a lot of advances in neonatal, neonatal care, extremely low gestational age, infants less than 28 weeks, or low birth, extremely low birth weight, less than 1,000 grams, started to be um, uh, saved. And then we found that stresses behind, besides high oxygen at birth um, would uh, increase ROP. So there are some studies that say High supplemental oxygen increases ROP. I think it probably does. And oxygen fluctuations also, just the fact that the infants, you know, every time they try to adjust the ventilator settings the nurses do, the infants have a fluctuation in their oxygenation. So we don't really know everything that does, but there are many stresses that, that um, uh, cause ROP. And so like our lab is interested in understanding what some of those stresses, what effects they have downstream on um, ROP using various models. The studies have not yielded clear guidelines as to what the oxygen saturation targets should be because a large scale multicenter clinical trials have found that low oxygen saturation targets are associated with low ROP, but they also are associated with increased mortality. And there's a lot of variability in the different sites so just keep your ears peeled. <laughs> we just don't have the answer yet. And other stresses have also been looked at. Um, so we really have revisited this, this uh, phase, uh, phases when we thought, think about human ROP. And we think more of phase one as really a delay in physiologic retinal vascular development. You know when you look at infants with ROP, you see that the vessels do not extend all the way to the peripheral retina. And then in phase two, there's a vaso, oops, sorry, vasoproliferation. And then there's actually a third phase in human ROP, and that's this fibrovascular phase where you develop a retinal detachment, either partial retinal detachment, stage four, or total retinal detachment, stage five. So here are some images from a RETCAM uh, in a human infant, and you can see on the upper left, there's just the hint of a line in the periphery with avascular retina in the upper outer area, that's stage one. When that line starts to gain volume and thickness, it becomes stage two. Stage three, there's area of extra retinal neovascularization. Stage four, retinal detachment. And I've kind of put down where I think of phase one on the left-hand side, phase two is the upper right, and phase three would be the bottom low, or bottom lower right panel. So, you know, whenever I think of a disease, I like to think of prevention, 
treatment of the acute disease, and then rehabilitation. And that pretty much follows every disease we know, right? So how do we prevent ROP? Well, you know, there are things that are being looked at. There was a recent study, a phase two study on IGF-1, which did not find an effect on ROP, but of course it's a phase two, so it wasn't really looking for that as a um, def definite outcome. But IGF-1 is being looked at. Uh, ways to promote vascularization in the peripheral retina. But there are also ways like how do we prevent premature birth? And I know we're ophthalmologists, but there are things that we can be aware of. You know, we can always advocate for good prenatal care. You know, if we know um, there are various ways we can just in the way we conduct ourselves in day-to-day -day life. Um, and then the acute treatment would be screening the infants with indirect ophthalmoscopy or now fundus images, and I'll go over some of the studies with that. We want to inhibit vasoproliferation, improve vascularization of the avascular retina, intervene at the right time point in progressive stage four ROP, and then visual rehabilitation would be treating the, the, what is known to be um, more common in premature infants with severe ROP, and that's myopia and strabismus. So general considerations of prematurity, maternal infections, chronic disease, maternal obesity, teen birth, multiple births, maternal drug use. These are the things that we know are associated with premature birth. The causes of premature birth are still not completely known. The screening recommendations, a lot of these I'm gonna go over quickly, but they're in your book. And you had, you had a, an assignment, that's what the the quiz is based on what you were to read, and I'm gonna to try to go over a little bit of that, but mostly new stuff. So the uh, symptoms or signs of ROP, uh, there are none, right? So what we have to do is screen infants, and in the US, we are, the recommendations are to screen infants less than or equal to 1,500 grams, or less than or equal to 30 weeks gestational age. Um, and to start screening examinations at 31 weeks, PGA, post-gestational age. So post-gestational age is gestational age plus chronologic age, and that's some. Um, or four to six weeks chronologic age. Does that make sense? I mean, if you have questions, you can just stop me, because I know I'm kind of, but in, in other words, if you have a 24-week gestational age baby at four weeks of age, that they would be 28 post-gestational age. Um, and then we always try to have the first exam before discharge because once the mothers and fathers and the infant who has all these other morbidities gets out, if they haven't sort of been established with the eye doctor, they, they could get lost and we want to prevent that. And then usually two examinations are needed to say that the retinas have vascularized to the aura and uh, before we say there's no worry of ROP. And once vascularization is, is complete to the aura serrata, then pretty much the risk of ROP is, is gone. Um, and these are also in your book. This kind of varies depending on who you happen to be seeing babies with, I think. Um, I generally see every week if there's uh, any ROP. And if it's in zone one on the first exam or zone two, I. I will maybe go to two weeks as long as there's no evidence of plus disease or ROP. Um, Postmenstrual age is also used, and I, I prefer postgestational age. Uh, they're sort of synonymous, but the problem is that I don't know that we really ever know postmenstrual age. That's, so it's gestational age and chronologic age in weeks. And uh, the thing to remember, this is, so one of the things really, really, really important is that when, when somebody says, oh, I've got a, I've got a baby who was born 24 weeks gestation, uh, 900 grams birth weight, and they have plus disease. Well, you want to know what their post-gestational age is because the PGA course correlates or corresponds very closely or pretty closely to threshold or severe ROP regardless of when they were born or their birth weight. So that's a, better, that's a better indicator of risk of severe ROP. So for example, if I have somebody who's 40 weeks gestation, 40 weeks post-gestational age, and they say, oh, I see a little bit of plus disease. I'll, when I see the baby, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, they're probably winding down. 
Maybe they had plus disease before that was missed. I checked the chart to see maybe they missed examinations because they were sick. There could be a lot of things going on. That baby I'm not as worried about is going on to develop type 1 ROP. But if they're 33 weeks, then I'm really concerned because the PGA for type 1 ROP, and we'll go over that too, is about um, uh, 35 weeks post-gestational age. And for threshold was about 37. So threshold is more severe. We really don't even talk about it anymore, but I'll, I have a slide that you can kind of go over to see um, what the differences were. And a lot of these are historic, you know, based on previous clinical trials. So cessation of screening, this is becoming more problematic now that people use anti-VEGF instead of laser, because anti-VEGF can, the, the um, recurrences can occur 45 to 55 weeks post-gestational age on average. One, one large, probably one of the largest studies currently uh, found that, whereas in, in um, uh, Infants who have no ROP, it's usually like they're, they're usually at 45 weeks and never stage three, they're probably fine to stop the, the screening. So it's really changed, uh, anti-VEGF has changed how we need to approach ROP. And there was at least one case report of an infant who was two and a half years old who had recurrent disease. So we're still learning, we still don't really know this, any of the specifics. And if there is type one or threshold disease, the recommendation now is kind of to try to get treatment in 48 hours. So I, many of the clinical trials use 72 based on the historic, but I think we're better off if we try to treat that baby at 48. So um, you, that is many, you know, I don't know how many of you have, do you go around with like the pediatric ophthalmologist? Yeah. So that's why I'm always like wanting to get a heads up if there's a baby that we need to be worried about. You know, it, it, what, what happens is I get, you, I, we have a type one baby, so the diagnosis is made and I have two days to try to get treatment. But if they can give me sort of, this is a type two baby that might be a little bit close to being type one, then I can go see them and, and sort of figure out and, and you know, kind of help the nurses know when, you know, we might have to treat next Tuesday. I'll come by Monday if, they're, if they need treatment, we'll get everything set up for that. But if they don't, we'll, we'll just continue to monitor them. So here are the parameters in ROP classification, the zone, the stage, plus disease, and extent of stage. And the extent of stage becomes important when we're thinking about progressive stage four ROP, which is retinal detachment. Um, so the zones, here are the zones. Zone one is centered, they're all centered around the optic nerve except zone three. And zone one is twice the distance between the optic nerve and the, where the fovea should be. So it, that's what the radius is. And we don't really know what the fovea is in these <laughs> infants. So we, have, we sort of estimate, and a, way, a good way to do it is use a 28 diopter lens, get an image of the eye when you're looking into the baby, and center the optic nerve in the center of your image. And that any, any vessels that don't go beyond that it's considered a zone one eye. So there's a lot of variability of zone one, right? You can have some babies that have 12 clock hours that are all within that image. Others where it's only one. And there are probably differences. There are differences in the severity of those cases, but we don't really distinguish that. The stages I've already shown you, stage one, two, three, and then stage four with a, a partial retinal detachment. <clears throat> Plus disease is, a, is a certain level of vascular tortuosity and dilation. And we talk about quadrants of involvement. In type one ROP, you just need two quadrants, whereas the old threshold disease, it was four quadrants. And here's an image of plus disease. We're, <clears throat> there's more work being done to try to quantify plus disease, so it's not just a qualitative uh, you know, guess or trying to remember an image in your head. <clears throat> A little bit on aggressive posterior ROP, so this is often seen in the first or second examination, and the baby may have, it doesn't progress through the typical stages of stage one, stage two, stage three. What happens is you see a baby, very posterior disease, often zone one or posterior zone two. Dilation of the retinal veins, tortuosity of the arterioles, 
and then they can have what is known as flat vascularization. So it, it shows a little bit, you can see over here, I don't know where my pointer is, sort of up in that area. It just looks hazy, and there's maybe a little bit of a line there, but it just gives you a sense of uh, a brush on top of the retina. That's stage three. The thing that's interesting about aggressive posterior ROP is that uh, may, when we treat with laser, we treat up to the vascularized retina, and it may be difficult to tell where that flat knee vascularization is. So you tend not to treat it. Also, there's a greater risk of hemorrhage if you treat it. But expect that once that regresses, you're going to get reactivation in, in between the junction of the vascular and the vascular retina. So that baby will need additional treatment. And I usually tell parents this, that we stage it, that this is to be expected. And then stage five ROP, again, the same picture because we really don't like to see this, so I use the same picture over and over. And it can, and if you look in cross-section, the retinal detachment can be all different kinds and all different configurations. And the one on the upper left is kind of considered an open funnel, and it's a lot easier to treat. Well, it's not easier, but it has better outcomes. Uh, whereas if you have a tight, tight funnel, it's the one on the bottom, it's hard to treat. You cannot, when you operate on these kids, you cannot get a hole in the retina. So it's not like an adult retina where you flatten the retina, put a hole in the retina, drain some retinal fluid, put laser. That won't work in kids. They'll just end up with severe PVR. So what we do is we have to release the traction. We often stage the procedures and over time the retina settles back. And time can be months, we expect that. So um, I'll show you some pictures of that in just a, a little bit too. So let's go, so any questions so far? <laughs> it's sometimes hard for me to give this talk because there's, there's so much and I try to figure out what would be the best way to present it to get a lot of information across in an organized fashion. So, if you do have questions, let me know. So there are various ways that we screen ROP, the indirect ophthalmoscopy and now wide-angle imaging like we use with the RETCAM, right? So the pros with indirect ophthalmoscopy, it's considered gold standard by many. It allows you to see the aura serrata. Um, concerns is it requires translation from viewings to retinal drawings. So, you, you know, the baby's moving and you're getting these images and you're trying to piece them together and, and figure out um, uh, all, as you look all the way around the uh, zone, the area between the um, vascular and avascular retina. Um, it, it can be uh, some difficulty with zone one and it requires training. Um, the, I'm not sure why zone one, I don't think there's difficulty with zone one. I'm gonna take that out, but that must have been something I read somewhere. So anyway, I don't think there's any trouble with zone one. <laughs> Inter now, oh, I know why I said that, because sometimes it's hard to tell zone one from zone two, unless you have a 28 diopter lens. Wide angle imaging, it permits longitudinal evaluation. It takes away some of that subjective uh, um, uh, diagnosis. It gives you the opportunity to have quantitative measures of plus disease. Um, and the concerns are in order to get wide angle, you lose resolution. So sometimes some of the images are not, don't give you enough information to be able to distinguish stage three, especially flat knee vascularization from just normal retina. Um, and it's very difficult, it's um, virtually impossible to evaluate zone three. So what's happened is they've come up with a new classification called referral warranted ROP. So if you're in rural United States and you have uh, a neonatologist or a neonatal nurse doing imaging, the idea is that they would send images to a reading center and the reading center would look for these three characteristics, any stage three ROP, any ROP in zone one or plus disease. And if any of those is present, that baby has referral warranted ROP and should have an examination with, and may need treatment. So it doesn't, it's not treatment, it's just whether or not that baby needs to have an examination. So there was a big study and we were a uh, site for it called, um, well, it's, we call it EROP, but it has a long name for telemedicine for ROP. And it provided strong support for remote evaluation of referral warranted ROP. 
and there was pretty good integrator agreement for zone one plus disease in stage three ROP and it hasn't actually there's not actually that none of the study says uh, w this is prime time to do telemedicine for ROP I think probably because of legal reasons but I think using it in combination with examinations and having a system set up I think will be important, uh, especially moving forward in the future. The number of ophthalmologists who are qualified to do exams and even treatment is becoming scarce throughout the world. So it's a problem and we need to address it. Now the, the level of severity for treatment. So, you know, again, I said sort of prevention, we're doing screening, we're gonna do now treatment and diagnosis of severity. So based on the cryotherapy for retinopathy prematurity study, in which the idea, the question was, does cryotherapy reduce a bad outcome in babies who have severe ROP? They looked for a 50, 5-0% risk of bad outcome. And those infants happen to have the following characteristics on the left side, zone one or two disease, five contiguous or eight total clock hours of stage three. So it was always stage three, four quadrants of plus disease. And as I said, unfavorable outcome in 50%. Type 1 pre-threshold was tested in the early treatment for ROP study, which used laser and, and some cryo, and found that these are the characteristics of type 1. Zone 1, any stage of ROP with plus disease, or zone 1, stage 3 ROP without plus disease. Zone 2, stage 2 or 3 with plus disease. And the unfavorable outcomes were about 15%. And um, the, uh, I think the reason they did the two or three is because sometimes it's difficult to distinguish two and three. They're close in their appearance. Um, and then treatment with laser, there's really strong evidence for that. There is evidence for treatment of stage three plus disease in zone one. So worse than type one, we're talking stage three and plus disease in zone one and poster zone two, based on the beat rob study, in which they use anti-VEGF compared to laser. Uh, infants were uh, randomized in that study. There were a lot of concerns about the study, um, and but but there are now clinical trials that are ongoing to uh, to be able to sort this out. Some of the positives about anti-VEGF are that. It's just, it's easier to do than laser. Laser really takes a lot of, of skill. And so I think because of the fewer number of ophthalmologists that are available to be able to do the treatment, it's, it's, it's just being adopted. But we need to have more information. The EGF is an important growth factor for developing infants and for neurodevelopment potentially. And so there are, we need to have more information on dose. There have been no dosing studies, but we're getting that. The PDIG study from, um, that is testing de-escalating doses of Avastin and severe ROP, we're a site for that. Um, we hopefully will have information pretty soon that will be published regarding dose. So again, the pros for laser, really strong evidence of efficacy and safety. We understand the natural history in these baby. Cons, maybe increased myopia, although a lot of the studies suggest that it's just if you have posterior disease that increases myopia. And I don't think we actually know at this point because we don't have any infants that we've followed more than you know, three or four years. So the myopia progresses as the, inf as the infant becomes a child. Pros for anti-VEGF, it does increase vascularization in the avascular retina by inhibiting VEGF R2 overactivation, and our lab was the one that found that. And it does reduce proliferation in one major clinical trial in ZO1 stage three ROP, in which it also promoted vascularization of the avascular retina. So there's evidence in human that it, it does as well. The cons are mainly that we just don't know enough yet. We don't know the right dose. We don't know the right uh, agent. Um, the treatment uh, varies with each infant, and yet we give the same dose. Like when you think about it, people are saying, well, in India, it has this great effect. And in India, the infants are 36 weeks gestational age. They're getting it, they're much older. They're almost twice as big as some of the premature babies that we are, treat in the United States. 
Anti-VEGF gets into the system that's been shown. It gets into the bloodstream. It's diluted less in the growth-restricted infants because the blood volume is less. The blood volume is about 6% of the infant's weight in kilograms. So yes, we don't know if it's, if it's actually active, but serum VEGF also goes down in these infants and it can stay down for two months. So there's a lot of information we just don't know yet. So the studies are being done and, and that's important, but for the individual infant, we have to deal with each one individually. And we take into information all the studies and series and everything done and what the infant has before we move forward. For all we know, maybe too much VEGF is also harmful. You know, that's, that's a question. We just don't know what normal is for a premature baby. Anyway, here, just now we're gonna go through slides pretty quickly. So here are some just current, this is one of the treatment. You treat the avascular retina all the way around, not just in the area of the stage three. This is what it looks like. We often do RETCAM images after treatment to make sure we don't have any skip lesions because they're very easy to develop. When you're um, depressing the eye to put in laser treatment, the eye gets really um, soft, and then you get these valleys where it's hard to see the avascular retina. And so you miss, miss and, and you can get skip lesions. The skip lesions need to be filled in a if they're not filled in right away at a later time to reduce the vascular activity of the eye. So stage four ROP, progressive stage four ROP, this is a really important, um, it's very, so it's very important to be able to um, assess um, when is the right time to go into these eyes. So the, so in the adult, we have four to six millimeters to go in, so we don't hit the lens, so we don't hit the retina. In the full-term infant, we have 0.87 millimeters. So we don't want to hit the retina because that's inoperable. That can lead to an inoperable situation. We don't want to hit the lens because that's bad for the uh, visual development of the infant. So the decision on when and if to operate on progressive stage 4 ROP is important. So we studied that too, and, and we found that there were really three things that were important. The extent of the ridge elevation, the presence of plus disease, and vitreous condensation. And those were the things that we taught, that we would, uh, we found to be significantly associated with progression of disease. And, and what we didn't find to be important for going in and operating was vascular activity, new neovascularization. In those cases, retreatment with either anti-VEGF or laser was what was important. So this just kind of shows you with a RETCAM. You can tell with the RETCAM image, you can see that the ridge is elevated because the vessels around the optic nerve are blurry. So you're looking at two different focal planes in the lower right. So again, lens sparing. The trectomy, our goals are to go in safely, avoid the lens, and then we basically have, sorry, I wish I had a, I don't know if I, I don't think I do. Um, red dot, there. ah, good. So we basically have various forces, and, and we decide which forces to address sort of based on the configuration of the retinal detachment, but um, we, we want to remove the circumferential force between the ridge and the anterior part of the eye. There's also one to the lens and, and anterior posterior, and then there's this circumferential kind of trampoline effect that we, we also release. And once we do that, then we get out. <laughs> and so here's an example of a stage four ROP. Now, I don't know if this is gonna work, but if it does, it, okay. So, so just we make our incisions about a half a millimeter posterior to the limbus, and you, the eye's small, so a half a millimeter is pretty big. I like to use a biome because the eyes squash with the avi, you know, they get pushed down. And so our goal, now this is a 20 gauge, I don't use 20 gauge anymore, but um, is to release the traction so here's the ridge, and so I'm going back and forth to release the traction there, and then also along in the posterior part. There, it's a little jerky, and part of the reason for the jerkiness is the lid speculum, so all these things kind of bounce you around in the eye. And that's why when I 
talk with people. So here's a really good example. All this is all this is scar tissue incorporated with retina, but we don't want to cut that because we'll get a hole in the retina. So I'm just releasing the the tractional vitreous between that scar tissue and the retina. And then I just put a bubble in the eye, not to flatten the retina, but just to make it easier to sew it up. So and um, so, and this is how this baby looked about one to two months later. So you give it time to settle back and it's, yeah, you know, it doesn't look pretty, but it's attached. You know, it doesn't look like a state five ROP and the baby has some chance of having vision. So, um, I think we went over all this. Sometimes we do a scleral buckle depending on where the detachment is. And for exudative retinal detachment, which does occur after laser or treatment, um, it, if it doesn't have a fibrous component, I may watch that, or sometimes I'll treat with subtina steroids. Okay, let's see. And the, and now most of the time when we do stage five ROP, which I hope I never have to do very often, I do a closed, a typical vitrectomy where I remove the lens and then just cut the scar tissue and use Helon to help push down the retina posteriorly so that I can identify where the areas are to cut and try to use two-handed technique whenever possible. But we used to do something called open sky vitrectomy where we would remove the cornea, remove the lens, and then the reason I'm showing this, I almost never do this anymore unless the cornea is hazy, but you can see this is retina and that fibrovascular tissue and you can see what it looks like when you cut it, you know, you see the scar tissue and this is actually what the retina looks like later. And then we put the cornea back on. Okay, I am, I think we talked about all this. And these are some of the conditions that can occur later with ROP, so there's a whole list. Um, they can, in the teenage years with myopia and as the eye grows, they can develop, the, it, the children can develop later retinal detachment. So. It's their retinal detachment throughout life, and um, and so we, they have to have continual monitoring. Okay, so now I'm going to get into some cases. So I'm kind of going to change the format. So it's less didactic, and we, we're going to talk about some cases here. So this is a four-year-old boy with reduced vision in the right eye, and this is how his retinas look. These are his. Um, you can see he's hyperopic. And he had a little bit of hemorrhage uh, by fluorescein angiogram, and this is his OCT. So, does anyone have any idea what it might be? Schesis. Schesis, right. It's X-linked schesis, it turns out, and he has a mutation in RS1. So he has neovascularization, and there can be several reasons why these kids develop neovascularization. We're actually reviewing our cases now to see where they follow. But it may be because of avascular retina within the schesis area. Um, it sometimes is related to, or there are several reasons why you can get vitreous hemorrhage, and we're looking at it. So one of them is neovascularization. But the vitreous hemorrhage can also be because of schesis, it's splitting of the retina, and the inner retina can be very highly elevated and put tension on the retinal vessels. So X-link schesis is one of the things, so for your OCAPs, that causes non-leaking uh, cystic, uh, quote, edema in the macula. It's, it's usually in a male, it's X-link. Um, it, and it's associated with these vitreous veils, vitreous hemorrhage, peripheral schesis in 50%. It can also be associated with retinal detachment, and it's passed on the maternal side. 60% have this ERG finding, so not 100%. So we use ERG to help us find an electronegative ERG, which is basically, I think of it that the B wave, There's a this would be what would be normal, B to A wave, right? The B to A wave is, is low, so it has a low B to A wave. So you see like almost no B wave here. here. But it's not 100%, and that's, I think, really helpful for me to remember because I'll get a kid in that I say, oh, this looks like schesis and do an ERG and it doesn't come out, and it's okay. It still can be ERG. 
So the RS1 gene encodes retina schesin. Retina schesin is thought to be one of these proteins that, that's important for keeping the retinal layers together, and it probably has other functions as well. Um, it, there have been described different anatomic features of schesis, and there is definitely a difference in how some of these respond and act. The um, infants that develop retina schesis end up having uh, poorer outcomes. Um, so the, this child had laser within the schesis to the avascular retina and partially cleared and vision improved. So I think that there's probably a hypoxic component to the uh, neovascularization in some of these patients as well. Um, okay, so, so the take home, and then we do sometimes operate on schesis. I, I, I'm pretty conservative with retinal schesis. If there's a retinal detachment, I try to do a buckle if I can. I look for a peripheral, because you can get outer retinal holes. There are a lot of inner retinal holes, but if you have an outer retinal hole or a dialysis, these are children, they can get dialyses just like anyone else. Then I'll do a buckle, but sometimes we go in and do a vitrectomy as well. The thing about the vitrectomy, I think you need to, and because the vitreous membranes are often firmer, more firmly adherent to the retina than the retina layers are to each other, you can't strip them. So I often will push the retina back in order to remove membranes from the retina. So a slightly different way of treating it. Case two is a five-year-old with poor vision in the left eye, no family history of poor vision, no history of trauma, right eye normal. So this is what it looks like. Any ideas what this might be? This is a boy. Coates, Coates disease, very good. Um, so the thing about Coates, Coates is 80% in male, but it can be in, in female then, right? 20%. When you see the exudates in the macula, that's not a good sign, but look out in the periphery for the, these peripheral retinal vascular abnormalities. When you do that, do an EUA, do wide-angle fluorescein angiography. I mean, if you can do wide-angle fluorescein angiography in the clinic, that's fine, but usually kids, it's harder. So you'll see these areas of avascular retina, you'll see these t tortuous telangiectatic vessels and um, the treatment, the treatment is laser to the areas of the leaky vessels and also to the microaneurysm type of dilatations with long-acting, uh, very low uh, energy laser. So you put it on continuous and you paint the vessels. Don't paint the normal, but just the abnormal. And then scatter treatment in the area of avascular retina. And the treatment is all the, you know, all the avascular run. So it's changed a lot from what it used to be now with wide angle fluorescein. And um, it, over time, the exudates will disappear. And then these, these children need to be followed yearly throughout their adulthood because it can reactivate later in life. Um, and then look at the fellow eyes, about 70% will have non -vas or avascular retina in the periphery, but that doesn't mean that it's um, pathologic. It, it, we just don't know, so we're monitoring it. It's more to help us understand why you would have a unilateral condition in this, why would it be unilateral in, in coats? Um, there, are, there can be severe uh, retinal detachment too, and we sometimes treat that, but again, we do it in a way not to cause holes in the retina. So it's di very different than how we treat adult retina cases. Um, okay. Uh, some of the things here that we wanna talk about, when you have bi definite bilateral with exudation, think of fascio-scapulo humeral muscular dystrophy because that is an association with Coates disease. Um, and there aren't too many other clinical associations with it. There have been staging of Coates disease um, back, Gomez Morales, this was pre-angiography, came up with this class of uh, stages. The shields kind of adapted it based on angiography, so uh, we often talk about these different levels of uh, Coates disease. Hopefully, 
What we want to do is be able to get telangiectasia only without exudates in the macula. Those kids do the best. That's often the cause of poor vision. Okay, so this is the, that, that child that I presented in the first. So this is uh, 13 months after laser and 21 months after laser. Vision is about 2060 now. He did have some anti-VEGF treatment. I treated with anti-VEGF mainly to see if I could prevent a choroidal neovascular membrane from form, forming, but I don't think we really, I don't think the evidence is that strong one way or the other. That's, that's to tell me I have five minutes before we go over the quiz. <laughs> okay, so um, now here's a good example of codes, all right? So this is a child that comes in with exudates, had reduced vision, I think, right? Vision was uh, 2070 in the left eye. Reduced vision, you can see the, the vascular abnormality here, the exudates coming down here, so partial retinal detachment. This is, the, this is what his OCT looked like, but look at the fovea. The fovea looks great. So the visual acuity is probably not from the exudates, right? It turned out he had amblyopia. And so don't, you know, always consider the visual rehabilitation part of all these conditions. This is how he looked at, like after laser treatment, so much improved. So this is what we want to find with, uh, okay, with um, Coates disease. So three-month-old in, uh, infant referred for persistent fetal vasculature in the left eye. So what this is showing you, this is avascular retina. All the vessels are pulled up into that fold. So this is the fold of retina. And this was the other eye. So this other eye, retinal vessels, hemorrhages up into the, into the vitreous cavity. And when we look at the angiogram, we actually see that there's neovascularization in the periphery. And as you see, this is it, for, because all the vessels are in that fold. No other family history known, no rashes, no hair, skin, tooth anomalies in female family members. Do you know why I was, that's important in the history? So one of the causes of this can be incontinentia pigmenti, and that, that's in females because it's um, X-link dominant, so it's lethal in, in males. But it's not that. <laughs> Do you know what it is? Fever. So this is a full-term infant that had this um, avascular retina. So we treated with laser, and I've been, you guys know this baby. I've been treating her, I'm going to treat her Friday. I've been seeing her every four to six months since she's now four years old said she was three months old. So left eye, I didn't, couldn't do anything to treat that. So the right eye I've treated with laser. She had a growth spurt and she ended up developing a tractional detachment. I've done lens bearing vitrectomies and buckles on her. So, but she's still able to play t-ball, you know, so she still has some vision. So they take, you know, these kids take any vision you have and do a lot with it. So that's why we keep doing, trying to make it better. This was an LRP five dominant mutation. Mother also has that mutation, but there's only pigmentation in peripheral retina. She's totally normal, even on uh, wide angle fluorescent angiography. So that's one of the things about fever. It can have extreme differences in expressivity and variability, even between the eyes. So um, treatment is laser to the peripheral eye vascular retina. Some people treat with anti-VEGF. I, I think the evidence is not as strong with that, but, but these are full-term infants. I didn't do that with her because she only had that one eye. I might have been more willing to do it if she had two eyes and treat one eye with it. I was afraid of a crunch phenomenon. Um, so the main causes that we know about are, are the um, mutations in the Wnt signaling pathway, so norin, which also causes nori disease, but you can get X-linked uh, fever, Frizzle 4 um, LRP5, T-SPAN12, and then this is not part of the Wnt signaling pathway, this ZNF408. And then there have been new mutations in KIF11 and beta catenin Remember that LRP5 can be associated with this condition, osteoporosis, osteopenia, uh, pseudoglioma um, syndrome, and we don't really have a good treatment for that, but DEXA scans and endocrinology is, is recommended. 
Um, it has been described with the George syndrome, which is immunodeficiency and poor growth, congenital microcephaly. Um, and it has a lot of variability. So the wind signaling pathway here, usually you have a wind that binds to frizzled 4 LRP5. There's also another co-receptor LRP6. T-SPAN 12 is a tetraspanin, so it kind of is somewhere in the membrane, I believe. And then this is the pathway that, that goes into beta-catenin signaling. Norin, the, the NDP mutation, Norin can also bind frizzled 4 and LRP5. So I think you have access to this whole thing, don't you? Like, I mean, won't I, I'll give you this. For, so I think you can have it all if you want to look at that. Because I want to go over the, um, let me see, I want to go over the, the quiz with you. I do want to just talk a little bit about non-accidental trauma, because you do see this. So it's related to shaking or blood trauma to the brain, and you can get these schesis cavities and bleeding in all layers of, including the just under the hyoid, right? So if you have a child like that and they have subhyoid bleeding that doesn't clear, we, it can be helpful to do surgery to remove the blood so that they don't develop anisotropia. They can actually get really myopic in one eye versus the other if there's a difference, or just myopic in both eyes. Um, and amblyopia. And they're usually infants, so we think about every one week for how long the blood has been there, especially if it's re really at birth, if they're near the time of the, the um, right near the time of birth. Um, sometimes what you can do is just have them stay upright in like a, whatever those things are that kids hang out in, and go like this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then that way the blood can settle. So if you see that happening, they'll be able to, it'll clear over time and then they may not need surgery. And, and that may be, you know, enough to be able to be sure they don't get amblyopia. So uh, SDOCT can be helpful sometimes in determining the vitreous and the schesis and work with the pediatric team. Okay. <laughs>